going to make a statement, and I'm not going to bring any commentary to it. I'm just going to make a statement. The Lord is in the process of restoring that which the locusts have eaten. He is in the process of doing that. And I'm grateful for that. Praise God. Something else that I wanted to share, and I really have been arm wrestling with the Lord over that. And how many, how many of you know and realize that that's a losing, losing battle? Um, you know, there's a lot of people that I can beat arm wrestling, a lot of people that I can't. And the Lord's going to be one that never will I beat in an arm wrestling match. And um, it's kind of to share a little personal testimony of how faithful the Lord is and how active and alive He is. And I, um, I, I'm in awe of it, frankly. Um, well, this week, the Lord has been very, very close and very, very tender. And, um, and I can go into a lot of things about uh, how He dropped that, uh, nine, that uh, Psalm 97 passage in my heart. And there's another truth, I believe, a nugget he dropped in my heart that may show up a little later in the message. Um, but I was sharing with Brenda, you know, earlier this week that, uh, you know, I thought I had a message. And uh, actually can show you because it's still on my, my computer upstairs. And, um, and then all of a sudden, in a blink of an eye, blink of an eye I didn't have a message. And um, I just really didn't know where to go. I really didn't. And, um, and, and let me just assure you before I go any further, I, please understand that I am not trying to impress you with my spirituality and my, my uh, sensitivity. I'm not trying to do that at all. I'm trying to, trying to elevate your thinking as far as, he, as, far as him. And so I um, went to bed Friday night and um, didn't sleep much at all because the Lord kept dropping a passage of Scripture in my heart. <laughs> and I argued with Him. Again, it's a losing battle, but I argued with Him. Lord, I've, I've preached on that passage so many times. People are sick of it. They think that's the only thing I really know. <laughs> yeah, but there, there may be some truth to that. <laughs> but... Um, um, uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, he kept badgering me with it. I'm, I'm using a kind of a harsh word there, but it felt like badgering. Um, with it all, all night long, and, and I kind of drifted in and out of consciousness, and then I woke up um, uh, Friday morning with the same passage on my mind. Oh, man, I guess I'll go to the church and and, and work with it if I have to. Uh, that was kind of my mindset, really, and, um, and so I did. And uh, the problem was I had some other work to get done, and, so it, was, and it was imminent work. I mean, it wasn't something that I could put on the back burner. Uh, it had to get done. And so I did it, and uh, over the course of the day, I, I, I typed out the passage, and I thought about it, and um, really not much coming together with it. And uh, then I went home and spent an evening with, um, with Brenda and some friends. And, and then I went to the office yesterday morning and began to, you know, concentrate and contemplate it again. And thought I had an outline and I came down here to pray in the sanctuary. And the Lord says, you know, forget that outline. Just forget it. And, um, and he said, I just want you to take the word of God, my word, into the pulpit. And I just want you to reveal it, <laughs> expose it. And, um, and so that's, that's my intent this morning, is to just uh, share the heart of God's Word from a very familiar passage. I know it's familiar because you've heard me talk about it many, many times. And it's in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Uh, but I do want to concentrate uh, on, on a very specific thing in that passage but it's going to be a short part of the message a little bit later. Uh, Acts 2, verses 42 through 47 reads like this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. There you go again. <laughs> Embarrassing me for not remembering. Everyone was filled with awe 
and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. You may be seated, and probably a little later in the message, we're going to address that, that last verse, which I believe is kind of the crux of why, why the Lord has um, drew, drew me to, that, to this passage. And maybe a focus that we may have for a little while, um, because it's a focus that we've not experienced and been part of for a while. I don't know why, but the Lord um, uh, yesterday uh, seemed to tell me that I needed to give kind of a short little synopsis on biblical interpretation. Because too often we read the scriptures and we, I, we isolate scriptures and we come up with our own thinking of what that is, and most of the time it's something that's convenient or good for us. Uh, it fits into our own personal theology or fits into our situation. And, um, and it may not have anything to do with that passage to say or meaning. It's not the true logos of the passage. And um, I'm not going to go through all of the, the concepts of, um, of, um, of interpretation or, um, uh, or understanding, you know, all of the different levels of, of that. But just a few very basic things that I think that we need to understand is is when you're reading a passage of Scripture, particularly if there's one that, uh, that you don't understand or it's really kind of frustrating you or uh, it's complicating things to you and you really know, what, is that, what does that mean? What is that saying? Uh, probably the first level of interpretation would be to understand what that word and the words of that, that verse or that passage um, uh, said in the original language. You know, the Bible was written in Greek and Hebrew and in some portions of, um, of Daniel and Ezra and Jeremiah are in Aramaic. Um, and so we have these languages. And it used to be, there was a day when it was the job of the pastor to stand up here and look intelligent, look good, to say, well, the Greek word here is X, Y, and Z, and this is what it means, and make application to it. And that is still a responsibility of a leader, a pastor, or a teacher. Um, but the Lord has made available to all of us many tools and many, many, um, many blessings to help all of us seek out truth in a deeper way. Uh, the, you can go to the internet and type in, what's the Greek word for whatever? And it'll give you the Greek word and the definition of that word. Uh, most of us have access to uh, maybe lexicons or concordances where you can look at the word and find out what it means. And it can give you a deeper meaning of the passage, and it can also interpret the passage for you. For example, in John's Gospel, the 17th chapter, he said, Now this is eternal life, that you know the Father. All right? And so if you are a true student of the Word of God, as you read the Scriptures, you're going to ask yourself some questions about certain passages. And you're going to say to yourself, or ask yourself, what does it mean to know Him? I mean, if simply knowing Him gives eternal life, there must be something significant about the knowledge of who He is. And so you go to a a lexicon or you go online and you find out that the Greek word for know is the same word that's used for a husband and wife uh, in an intimate relationship, a sexual relationship, where when this relationship is handled properly within the context of marriage, it is holy and it is righteous and it's proper and it's good, but it's also the deepest expression of love between two people. It is the expression of love that separates the relationship between a husband and wife than a relationship between a friend, you and a friend. This relationship, this intimacy, this knowing of this other person makes this relationship or takes it to a deeper and higher level than any other relationship. Amen? 
And so when you understand that the word no means that, and you've heard it preached anyway, you already knew that, um, then you begin to understand that eternal life is having a, an intimate and deep relationship with the Father. It takes it to a new, no, new level. It's not just knowledge of who He is, but it's, a, it's an intimacy that is so deep that it's not shared with anyone else or anything else. Amen? So you understand that, that, that going to the Greek or going to the Hebrew or going to the Aramaic helps you to understand what it means, but also the depth of it. Amen? Another uh, form of interpretation would be contextual. And, uh, and I believe that, uh, that Scripture should be re- read in context. Uh, that's, I, I'm a promoter of, of reading the Scripture a book at a time. You know, you can go to most study Bibles, you can understand why a certain writer wrote the book, what were the conditions, what was the purpose, what was the theme of the book, and you can carry that, that knowledge into the reading of the Word of God, and then you can understand that, well, this happened here, so that makes sense why this happened here, and because it's setting up for something that's happening here. So it's within, within context. A perfect example would be here in this passage I just read. There are two verses that speak of breaking of bread. And interestingly, in both verses, the word bread is translated from the very same Greek word. But they are two different things when you read it in context. In verse 42, you see they're devoted to a couple of things. They're devoted to to the teaching of the Word of God. They're, they're devoted to the community of faith. They're devoted to, the, to, um, to prayer. And it says they're devoted to the breaking of bread. And so in that first verse, we're talking about worship, aren't we? We're talking about celebration. And so within the context of this, most scholars believe that they're talking about the Lord's Supper, communion. They were, they were faithful and devoted to those things. But then when you go down to verse, um, I believe it's, let's see, 46. It says, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. All right? So the context there suggests that they came together and they had a meal together. They had fellowship. They had, they had um, uh, a time of interaction uh, and they just enjoyed one another's company over a meal, uh, which was an important thing in biblical days. It wasn't quite as passive as we make it out to be today. There was intimacy involved with that idea of breaking bread together. Now those are simplistic things, but you need to understand Scripture within the context it's written, and a couple other ways, the land, you know, the, the, the culture in which it's written and, and, and the culture that it's communicated to help us to understand and interpret Scripture. Now, in this particular passage, it's within the context of, of Pentecost, isn't it? Jesus had arose from, you know, he broke the power of the grave. He ascended to be at the right hand of the Father. And he told the disciples to go in Jerusalem and wait. And it was, it was the Feast of Pentecost, and so what did we have? We had people from all over the known world at that time there in Jerusalem celebrating Pentecost. We also know, uh, based on an earlier passage, that they, they, were, they were so diverse that they brought multiple languages to the table. And so they're there in, in, in Jerusalem. Jesus had told them to wait. He actually gave them the reason to w- why they were waiting because I'm sending a, a comforter to you. Wait there for the Holy Spirit to come. And so they're waiting. And then the Holy Spirit falls on them. And when he falls on them, he cleanses their hearts and frees them from the power of sin. And we celebrate that, amen? He frees them from the power of sin and he fills them with his presence. But along with that, he fills them with all of the good things that come from the Holy Spirit, like giftings and, and, um, and fruits and all of these things that we attribute to the Holy Spirit. They are given those things. And in the midst of that celebration, in the midst of that, that, that ex- explosive experience, Peter gets up and preaches a message and Everyone there hears the message in their own language. 
So now you have the gift of communication, the gift of language being, being, uh, being on display, and people are hearing it articulated, they understand it, and 3,000 people are one to the Lord. Amen. And so now what do we do? There's a problem. The problem is we have these 3,000 people. Now the church is just a few days old, and now it's grown to 3,120 people. Uh, I can't wrap my mind around that. What do you do with this? You know, how do you organize and how do you structure? How do you handle this? Well, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, giving them wisdom and revelation that, that Paul talks about in Ephesians, they begin to establish the church on principles that are eternal. Principles that, that stand the test of time. It's almost a no-frill thing. They're not interested in entertaining. Why are they doing this? Because they know these 3,000 people in a few days are going to be dispersed and they're going to go back to their homeland. And if we don't get the roots of what they experienced down, down deep in their hearts, they're going to go and eventually slip back into their own lives and their own culture and their own lifestyle. And what, was hap what happened here, this it's significant thing that happened here on the day of Pentecost can be lost out there in the far reaches of their world. So the church pays the price of, of, of discipling these people and raising them up in the faith. And how beautiful it is because, because God is a God of, of mission. He has a mission, amen? And how beautiful it is that he would pour his spirit out on Pentecost when all of these diverse people are there and they can hear the word and they can get saved and, and probably during the course of time filled with the spirit themselves and then they would be dispersed. And all of a sudden, now you have the church on display throughout the known world. Amen. Amen. And so what we have here, in my estimation, is just a few verses here that give us a, a, a job description of a model church. This is how they functioned. This is who they were. And when you read a passage like this, you have to check your own spiritual pulse, and you've got to step back and say, all right, how do we align with this? How do we measure up? This is the plumb line. Are we lined up with it? Are we on the level? Are we aligned with what the Holy Spirit did with the church and wants to continue to do with the church? And so we're just going to look at this verse by verse this morning. And, and go ahead, Shannon, and leave the, leave the passage up there. Is it, is it on one screen? It's not? Well, you, you can just follow along. That's an interesting 42, though, isn't it? I don't know. We'll blame 43, too. That's all Caitlin. All right. It's all Caitlin's fault. All right. Verse 42. We see the kind of the job descriptions right there in what the church is about. Just that one verse. Luke says they devoted themselves to about four items here. And I'm captured by the word devoted. And I looked at about seven or eight different versions, and I came to realize that almost all of them, with the exception of one or two, use some form of the word devote. And when I think of the word devote, I think of the word of, I think of purposefulness. I think of commitment. I think of priorities. I think of establishing something that's unmovable in their lives and in their mission. When you devote yourself to a job, your, your boss expects you to do that. If they're going to give you a paycheck, then they expect you to be devoted to what that job requires. If you're, devoted, if, if you're in a marriage, you're expected to be devoted to the well-being of your spouse and your children. And, and so there are many things in our lives that we devote ourselves to. In other words, it's a priority, and the rest of my life is going to be, is going to be worked around this. Exercise routines. If you, if you make a decision that I'm going to get in shape, unless you devote yourself to it, you're not. 
If you're going to lose weight and, 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 be, and eat a healthy diet, if you don't devote yourself, it won't happen. All right? There has to be an element of devotion for you to be successful in any of these things. And so it's true with the means of grace. It's true with the church. Luke says they devoted themselves to what? First of all, the apostles' teaching. We would call that the Word of God because most of the Word of God, or the Word of God that we have has co- came from those early church leaders. And most of the ones probably doing the teaching were those that were with Jesus for up to three years. They walked with Him. They sat at His feet. They, they, uh, they rubbed shoulders with Him. Uh, they embraced Him. He embraced them. They watched him as as he walked through trials. They watched him as he ministered. They watched him in terms of his priorities. They watched him in, 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 in how he handled suffering. They watched him in relationships. They saw, a, they saw a perfect picture of what holiness in the flesh looks like. And so in essence, what they were doing was they were pouring Jesus into the lives of these people. And I would venture to say, based on what Jesus himself said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, if you just simply had the the four Gospels to work with and you understood the character of God through Jesus, you would be okay, amen? Because who are we supposed to be like? We're supposed to be like him. We're supposed to be Christ-like. We're supposed to be just like Jesus. He is our model. He's our standard of holiness. He's our standard of mission. He's our standard of relationship. Everything that we're part of, he is the standard. He is the model. He's the poster child of righteousness and holiness. Amen? And I hope that didn't sound disrespectful to you. It wasn't intended that way. And so they knew who Jesus was. Their foundation was laid by his presence and his teaching, his character. And so they just spent time with these people pouring Jesus, pouring Jesus, pouring Jesus into their lives. Because they knew when we release them, the more Jesus they have, the more likely it is they're going to make it when they get out there. Amen? And so they spent, they devoted, they said, by all means, we're going to do this. We're not going to concern ourselves with the Book of the Month Club. We're not going to concern ourselves with all of these betterment things. We're going to concern ourselves with the only one that can make us better anyway, and that's Jesus. And they poured Jesus and poured Jesus and poured Jesus into their lives. And that's a standard that is set for you and I and for the community of faith that we're part of. Are we effectively pouring Jesus into the lives of the people we serve? Are we doing that? Are we as leaders and teachers, are we effectively studying and seeking him out to know his character? Are we doing that enough that we know him well enough that we're just pouring him in and pouring him in and pouring him in? Are we doing that? That's rhetorical. You don't have to answer. And I have to ask myself that. Are we pouring, am I pouring Jesus into you as I have access to you in this fashion one time a week? And they were devoted, they, they were devoted to that task. They were devoted to the fellowship, which, which means what? The community of faith, amen? The church. And, and some of you may be smiling right now because I've gotten on my high horse on this a lot of times. And I probably will a lot more times. Because this, this is an issue that really is hurting the church in, recent, in this recent culture. For many, too, way too many people, church has become a convenience. If I'm off work, I'll go. If there's not a ball game, I'll go. If the weather's not good enough for me to go to the beach, I'll go. If I get to bed early enough on Saturday night, I'll go. If I don't have company in town, I'll go. And, and all of a sudden, the list becomes really, really long as to if all of these things line up, okay, then I'll go be devoted and faithful to the community of, of faith. And that's not what the community of faith was designed to be. There, it's designed to be a priority in our lives where we're devoted to it. And we teach our people and our children to be devoted to it, to where we schedule and work our lives around it. Amen? That's what devotion is. Devotion is not convenience. Devotion is, well, you know, when your alarm goes off on Monday morning to go to work, you know, do you sit there and think about, well, I'd rather be at the beach or there's a program on TV I want to watch or 
well, I've got company from out of town. I'm just going to stay home today. No, you don't do that. You're devoted to your job and you go because there's consequences if you don't. Amen? And so there are consequences when you're not faithful to the, to the community. There's, there's consequences in the sense that, that the relationships are not as deep as they could be. There's opportunities of learning that you're losing. Uh, you're, you're putting yourself out on an island where the adversary wants you to be. And so it's important, church, that, that we promote the community of faith in the sense that, there's, that, that we, need to, we need to be devoted to it. I'm not talking about the structure of the church. I'm talking about an organism here. A, a, a thing that has a life of its own that requires some organization for it to move freely. But God has called us. He's called us to a community where not only we are blessed, but we bring something to the table to bless others. Amen? And it's got to be something that's a part of our DNA. This is who we are, and this is what we're going to be, and our calendars are going to operate around this. Amen? And so they devoted themselves to teaching. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, which we've already decided and determined that that's probably the Lord's Supper, which was designed for what? It's designed for remembrance. When you take the bread, you remember his body being broken for us. When you take the juice, it, is, it represents his blood that was spilled for us. It's an it's a, um, ordinance of remembrance. We do it for a reason because, because we're supposed to remember the sacrifice that was made for us. And, and we need to remember that from time to time when we get a little bit haughty and a little bit full of ourselves, that we didn't do this for ourselves. God did this for us at a great price, amen? The cross was a great price. And we also need to remember it when we're, we're, we're down on our luck and things are not going well. We need to remember the foot of the cross because that's where the victory was won. Amen. So it's about remembrance. And these apostles we're teaching these people in this model church to always remember the cross. Always remember the blood. Always remember the broken body. And dare I say, remember the empty tomb. Amen? Remember, remember, remember. And then he says they were devoted to prayer. And uh, I, there, I can't really say enough about that. Prayer. Prayer is significant. You cannot live a successful Christian life without being a person of prayer. The community of faith cannot, cannot fulfill its mission without prayer. If you read the book of Acts all the way through, you've got to walk away with the conclusion that prayer was a priority in that early church both in the closet, individually, and coming together corporately. It is vital. They did it over and over and over again. When trouble came, they got together and they prayed. They prayed, they prayed, they prayed. Amen? And so, as a church, if we are going to be a New Testament church, those things that we are responsible for, we need to be devoted to. For example, the teaching of the Word of God the, the fellowship, being faithful to the fellowship, the remembering of what Jesus did for us, and the act of praying, 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 praying. And that establishes a foundation for what almost everything else happens in this passage. All right? You're a person of the Word. You're really studying. You're not just doing drive-bys. You're really studying the Word. All right? You are, you are genuinely faithful to the community, not only in your attendance, but you're actually faithful in trying to really get in the lives of the others and letting them in your life. You are remembering and you are a person of prayer. And what, is that? what happens there? What happens in a church like that? Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Now, that's an unfortunate translation because most translations say that many wonders and miraculous sights were done through the apostles. It says by, it means they're doing something. All they're doing is being obedient conduits. It is the Holy Spirit that does the work and the wonders in the church. 
We are conduits. We are servants. We are just available for the Holy Spirit to work in, to work through, and to work around. Amen? And so a better translation is that these were done through the apostles. Now, what does it tell me here? It tells me that in a, in a thriving church, a church that is spirit-led, a church that's doing things right, a church that is, that is uh, uh, that's following the, the model of the early church, which is the model, is a church that sees on a regular basis wonders and miraculous signs. Maybe not every week, not may, maybe even every month, maybe so. But it's a, it's a regular occurrence that God himself manifests himself in their community. And when he manifests himself, what happens? He manifests himself in evangelism. People come to know him personally. They're convicted of their sin and they're transformed. He manifests himself in cleansing and purity. He manifests himself in healing. He manifests himself in, in deliverance. He manifests himself in, in monetary ways to bless you and to bless me and to bless the community. He, he manifests himself to do great works among us for his glory first and then for our benefit. Amen? But you see, the foundation is set. They're people of the Word. They're faithful to one another. And they are praying. And in that atmosphere, God has the ability to move beyond the perimeters that most of us set for Him. Amen. And we begin to see Him manifest Himself in ways that glorify and honor Him. We also see that in, in verse 40, 44 that in a church like this, there is an unusual and supernatural level of generosity. And why, why are they generous? Why are, there, why are, there, why are they free? Uh, well, that's actually verse 45. We'll come back to 44 in a minute since I've started. All right? There, there, there's an unusual and supernatural gifting here of, of generosity. Why would they be so generous? Well, first of all, they're students of the Word. And they begin to understand that the Word teaches that we don't own anything. The Word teaches that we are stewards of what we have. The Word teaches that He blesses us, whether it's with time or money or stuff or giftings or talents. He gifts us and blesses us with things and stuff so that we can be a blessing to others. It's never designed to pat our own nests. It's never been designed for us to to hoard and, and to keep things for ourselves because it's not ours to begin with. It's not ours. It's His. And when you understand biblical stewardship and then you're loving one another because you're faithful to the community and you're a person of prayer, you have no issue whatsoever pulling the wallet out or the checkbook out and making somebody else's life a little bit better because you can. Amen? And so it tells us here that, that they were selling possessions. They were selling property. They did this in chapter 4 as well. And goods and they gave to anyone as he had need. That's what the church looks like. The church looks after its own, amen? The church cares for its own. Families care for their own. And we're a family. But also, and I think one of the reasons this happens uh, so easily to these people is back in 44 when they had... They, all the believers were together and had everything in common, and so there was, a, there was an unusual unity among them. Now, it wasn't a unity in the sense that everybody agreed with everything. But where they did agree was in the pursuit of truth. They agreed that they, pers- they wanted to pursue truth together, and they knew where to find truth. Real truth is found only in one place. It's from the heart of God, primarily through the Word of God. Amen? That's truth. And, and what really brings unity to a community of, of people is that we are all pursuing that same truth together. We're pursuing Jesus together. And in most cases, we're going to come through the reading of the Word and pursuing truth with, with primarily the same idea of what that truth is expressing particularly in the areas of salvation, but even in those peripheral areas as well. Unity is not simply because we're together. Unity is, because, is not because we all live in the same city or the same area of that city. 
Unity is because the Word of God, the truth of God, embeds itself in our hearts, every one of us, and it draws us together in community. Amen? And because the Word of God has embedded itself and we, we are in unified and we're together, and then when there's a crisis, somebody loses their job, somebody's sick, so, some, an accident happens, something happens when somebody of our number is in need, we say, you know what? Here. 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 We take care of it. Amen? Um. I talked about the community of faith earlier and I failed to mention that in verse 46 that tells us they continue to meet together in the temple courts for times of worship and instruction. But also in this church there was a desire for real community and not just being at the same place at the same time. You see right here this is not community. We're just all in the same building. Community is when you're actually doing life together. Where you actually know somebody by name. And I, I hesitate to say that because I'm one of the worst people in the world for remembering names. I mean, you could tell me your name if you're relatively new to the church uh, every Sunday for a while and I'm going to look at you and I'm going to think and I'm almost going to be embarrassed. Could I stop it? Just stop it. And uh, Janice, just this morning, she had to walk up to me immediately and said, I'm Janice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember it right now. <laughs> I hope I remember it later. Um, but, but the reality is, uh, we, we, we know each other's names. We, we sit down and get to know where you're from, what do you do, you know, what's, what's, you know, do life together. You see, when you do life together, you're a little more sensitive to one another. When a prayer request comes across Facebook and, and, uh, and David Almeida's uh, sister is at death's door, you're saying, you know, I got to know Dave a couple weeks ago. We had a cup of coffee together or we stood in the back of the church. You know, I... I'm going to pray for him. I'm, I'm a little, you know, I feel bad for that because we've developed a relationship. You don't do that necessarily with someone that I, I think I've seen him before. <laughs> That's not relationship. And so we have to understand that community is more than just being a member of the same place. It's more than just attending the same place. It's, it's being involved in the lives of those in that community. Amen. And so in this early church, they broke bread in their homes. Oh, man, can you imagine that? That's not done much anymore, is it? Very rarely are people invited to someone else's home for a dinner. But it's kind of a neat thing to do, isn't it? Because it's quiet. There's a little more intimacy. You can hear one another think. You know, there's just, it's probably a little cheaper, too. <laughs> And there are some that can't afford to go out to restaurants, and we need to be sensitive to that. We want to fellowship with you, and, and so come to my home. We'll cook a dinner. And so they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together, and they were glad about it, and they were genuine about it, and they, uh, they, were, they were sincere about it. And even here, right here in this community, most of us here, when we walk out these doors, you got a restaurant in mind that you're going to. Why not invite someone that you don't know very well to go with you? Why not? Look around the church. There's somebody here you don't know well. There's somebody here. And they like to eat too. And maybe they can't afford to go to restaurants, but they would enjoy doing that. She agrees. Or he, rather, sorry. That's where relationships are built. Sitting across the table for someone, breaking bread, Getting to know them. You know, I'm the king of interviewing. I, I sit down with a, with a new person, and it's, it's question after question after question. I, I, I want to know where they're from. I want to know what they do for a living. I want to know about if they got siblings. Uh, I want to know all of these things about them because I want to know who they are. And that's, that's how we gotta, we got to approach this, this community thing. And they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. This is where I'm at right now. Because they did all of these things in these first verses. They were faithful to the Word of God. They were, they were faithful to the community of faith. They were faithful in remembering. They were faithful to pray. 
They were faithful in their generosity and with, with the stuff that God has put in their lives. All of these things they were faithful with, all of those things came together to make them appealing to the outside world. And as a result of that, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I, w I did one time, I, I should have brought it with me, I, I took one of my Bibles and I read through the book of Acts and I just highlighted every single time the, the growth of the church was, was mentioned. And I had a lot of highlighted passages where you see things like, and the church grew to 3,000, and the church grew to 5,000, and the Lord added to their number daily, and, and the church grew, and, 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 and many priests came to know the Lord. And over and over and over again, you see that the church was expanding and growing. In fact, that was Paul's mission. He would go into a community, start a church, get people saved, raise up leadership, and move on to the next community and do it again. And so his whole idea was to expand the kingdom of God. That's the mission of the church. We are a living organism, and living organisms are designed to grow and expand. Amen? And I, I have to, you know, when I knew the Lord wanted me to go this direction, I was a little embarrassed about it. Some of you have heard me, heard me talk like this before. It's one of my weaknesses, of probably many, and I'm not going to ask you to, to catalog them, but one of my weaknesses from the very beginning has been evangelism and outreach. Maybe not so much outreach because, you know, down, down through the years I've had some ability to, to fill a room from some, you know, periodically you know, by doing some special event, but in terms of getting people transformed and saved and genuinely changed, that's not been a strength of mine throughout my ministry. And as a result of that, because I'm the leader here, that's not been a strength of our community. So I take, that's on me, it's not on you. But in recent days, the Lord has, has, has brought change into our family's life. Uh, and one of, those, one of the reasons there's been change, or one of the reasons that I believe he's, he's, he's um, uh, brought change is to get us out of our glass bubble so we can come into some contact with people who need ministry and need help. Um, we've lived in a glass bubble for a long time, you know, being at, at Southwest and at church, and, and the reality is we live in a broken world, a hurting world. Uh, we, we live in a world that needs the church to, to filter into it to be salt and light. Um, and I'm not talking about just having a bounce house out here in the front yard and having a big, you know, make a bunch of hot dogs and get a couple hundred people here. That's not evangelism. Evangelism is presenting truth to someone and they say yes and they get saved. And then you disciple them and raise them up in the Lord. And so we've had this confrontation with the Holy Spirit here in recent days, personally, but then I go to district assembly and, and they just really made me mad. Because everything there was about the mission. Everything there was about outreach and evangelism. Everything was about raising up someone to be a servant of God. Not a church member, a servant of God. Everything was about that. And it just ticked me off. Because I, I knew that that was a change that had to happen in my life. I can't expect you as, as the community that's under my charge to take, embrace that if I don't embrace it and lead the way. Now, there may be some times where we have to program something to, to reach into the lives of people, but the reality is God has already given you a mission. He's given you a job where there are people there who are lost. He, he's, he's given you a, a neighborhood to live in where there are people that are lost. He's planted you in a school where there are people that are lost, even in a Christian school. All along the way, he's positioned us to be light. But one of the, one of the greatest disservices we've, we have in this culture is the electric garage door opener. Because nobody has to get out of their car outside and say hi to their neighbors. We never have to see the outside of our house. We can go in the garage, shut the door behind us, go in the house, be with our family, have an evening, go, go out the next morning, 
hit the, hit, the, hit the button again, pack out and go. Where when I grew up, at least once or twice a week, you, you could see somebody mowing the yard next to you and you could stop and say, hey, what's going on? Or you would have neighborhood barbecues and, and, and get together in, in some of those old days. Maybe some of those old techniques need to be relived. Amen? Maybe we need to be more purposeful. Maybe we need to go to the same coffee shop on a regular basis so we get to know the barista. Maybe we need to go to the same grocery store and look for the same checkout people so that we can know, get to know them by name. Maybe we need to get to know the names of our neighbors. Do you know the names of your, your, your neighbors' names? Some. All right, but that's better to me. All right. Um, <laughs> Whether you recognize it or not, we are at a serious moment. <laughs> now the moment's gone. We can do all of this stuff up front. We can sit together and, and form a, a, a Christian um, country club and come and study together, have study groups. We can be devoted to one another and we can have our potlucks and all of the things just for us. And we can be happy about it because we're in relationship with one another. But that's only part of the mission. That's a part of the mission because we need to be a community. But we need to be a community that's healthy so that the community at large can be reached. Amen? You don't have a job today for a paycheck. I've said this a hundred times. Hopefully I'll, I'll be here long enough to say it another hundred times. If you understand why you have your job, you're there because you're on mission for Him. If you embrace that, you can walk through the, the times when your boss is a little, of, a little bit of a tyrant. You can walk through it when there's times when you don't get the promotion you think you deserve. Or you don't get the raise you think you deserve. Or you're not being treated properly. You're not there for that. <laughs> you're there for Him. If you're a teacher, you're there for Him. It's all about Him. And we need to be pouring Jesus in the lives of one another, but we also need to be pouring Jesus in the lives of people who need Him. Amen? I don't know how this is going to play out, but I know in the organic way, you need to make friends with somebody so you can lead them to the Lord. That's the best way. Do you know that whoever the experts are, I don't know who they are, but I hear this, this term, the experts say. <laughs> I don't know who they are. But the experts say that 86% that of the people who come to know Jesus or come to the church are there because of a friend or a loved one. And I know there's probably a few people here that just kind of walked in on your own. But most of, most of us here are connected with someone. Someone invited us that we are a friend with or a or, or family member. That's just been the case down through the years. You know, someone comes to know Jesus, they want somebody else to know Jesus. Let me ask you this. Is it, isn't it right, and I know I need to get out of here, um, isn't it right to experience the saving grace of Christ, to be delivered, to be transformed, to be given new life, to be given purpose? Isn't it a proper and right thing to want others to know that same thing? If, <laughs> thank you, sir. Is that an amen for you? Okay. Do it one more time. All right, that's an amen. All right. Remember what I said earlier? God does things for you and gives you things and blesses you so that you can bless others. If he has blessed you with salvation, it's because he wants you to know him, but he also wants you to propagate that same message. If you've got a family member that's unsaved today, it's wrong to hide it from them or keep it from them. If you've got a neighbor that's unsaved, it's wrong for you to hoard it and not share it. If you've got a fellow worker, listen, go eat lunch in the, in the break room. Don't sit there at your, at, your, at your desk and play solitaire for an hour. No, you walk. You walk. That's right. Don't do that. Go to the break room and get to know someone. I'm kind of beating a dead horse now, I think. 
The two things that, 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 that I really am, am kind of on a, on a soapbox about is faithfulness to the community of this community, our community, but also understanding that we've got to get outside of our perimeters and outside of ourselves. We've, we've got to start, and I've got to lead to do it. We've got to start reaching people who need Jesus. Amen? Amen. So you pray for me. I need to do it on a personal level, and I need to understand how the Lord wants us to do it corporately. I don't know what it's going to be, dinners for eight, you know, whatever it is, more life groups, you know, start a life group for the purpose of, of bringing in some new people. I don't know how it's going to play out. But it's going to be a matter of prayer for me and the board, because we've talked about this just recently. And so are you, are you ready to join me? Are we ready to expand the perimeters of our fellowship? Are we ready to expand the, the kingdom of God and see brand new people? Let me tell you something. I keep telling you something. <laughs> uh, one of the best ways to breathe energy into a church is to bring brand new life into it. Man, you get a brand new believer, man, they're nuts. They're bouncing off the walls. They, there's, there's, there's no limitations of what you can do because they don't have this ecclesiastical church rules that they follow. They just want to, they just want to love people and love God. You know, but then they're in the faith long enough, you know, that's tempered because they begin to, be, to get a little bit religious. So let's, uh, let's speak death to religion and life to relationship. Not only with us and him and with one another, which I, I value deeply. You know me, I'm a social guy. But I, I want to get outside of myself. I got a friend here, John, I hope I don't embarrass you. John's a, a new to our church, been here for three Sundays. And he's one of those guys that, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, and he wants to be involved in ministry. And the first time I met him, we talked at length in the, in the back of the room and and I just, you know, I was asking questions, you know, what brought you here? Why did you choose here? You know, and, and, uh, and he began to tell me that when he was at school in Huntsville, that he attended a Nazarene church there, the Huntsville church. And when he came here, he wanted to find a Nazarene church. Now, that doesn't have much in this culture either, but he wanted to find a Nazarene church. And I thought to myself, well, you know, in Houston, there's a bunch of them. Now, this is really not a, a way to win customers, you know, because you, know, custom, you don't go to McDonald's and they tell you where Burger King is. <laughs> You know, but we're having a we're having a, a, a real Christian communication, a fellowship, and I just was curious, or why why the crossing? I mean, Living Words over here, First Church is over here, Southwest is over here, all of them within decent driving distance. Why here? And he said, Well, I live in Aleaf, and I wanted to be part of a community where I can invite people to come and be part of it, and it would be convenient for them to do so. I love John. I love that heart. I love that mindset. Of, of how we, we, he actually is looking for people to bring into the fold. We need to begin seeing people through the eyes of Jesus. Let me tell you something. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Let's stand, and I apologize for keeping you so long. I got to ramble in there at the end. Praise God.